Okay, so uh, good morning or uh, good evening, uh, depending on where in the world you are. Uh, we are here again with our uh, appointment with uh, the Alumni Association uh, webinars. Uh, it's a monthly uh, appointment. So uh, thank you uh, to Professor Yoko Kato, who uh, is not here uh, now because she is busy with an emergency operation, but hopefully she will be able to uh, join us uh, a bit later. Uh, good morning to uh, Ishu Bishnoi, my co-moderator. Uh, thank you, uh, Raja and uh, Liu, uh, for the organization. I see also many other friends, uh, Adi, Iti Chai. Uh, and thank you to our uh, speakers today. We have two uh, great speakers with very interesting topics. Uh, the first speaker is Professor Scott Robertson, and uh, the second speaker is Dr. Heba Azuz. Uh, I have the pleasure to uh, introduce our first speaker. Uh, Professor Scott Robertson is a board certified neurosurgeon, neurological surgeon with more than 20 years of experience in general surgery, with a particular emphasis on spinal surgery. He was trained and completed his residency at the University of Iowa in the United States, and he worked as consultant and assistant professor in Florida, Texas, Colorado, and finally in Louisiana, where he currently works. He is a member uh, of the editorial board and reviewer for several scientific journals, and he had several appointments uh, in the committees of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. Uh, he also is author uh, of a number of papers and uh, book chapters. And today uh, he will talk about anterior cervical discectomy and fusion complications and avoidance. And so a very uh, interesting and useful topic for especially for uh, uh, young neurosurgeons so uh, we are all eager to know uh, your uh, tips and tricks about this kind of surgery professor robertson so uh, could you please start your uh, your talk and thank you to be here yeah. Thank you again for the young neurosurgeons and for organizing this it's a real pleasure to uh, be here and to speak to you all. Um, and now actually it's been almost 30 years since I first started training. So they, um, they uh, before we get started, I just wanted to kind of reiterate and say my thoughts and prayers are out to all the, the family and friends in the Ukraine. And we hope this, uh, this war or conflict ends soon. You know, none of us like war. And we were just uh, commenting about how Many of the young neurosurgeons aren't familiar with war uh, and the, the devastating effects. So again, our thoughts and prayers, and this is a statement provided by the World Federation and a lot of the, the um, American uh, uh, neurosurgical societies. As mentioned, um, I'm gonna be speaking about uh, uh, anterior cervical discectomy and fusion complications and avoidance. I think it's a valid topic because Anterior cervical discectomy infusion is one of the most common uh, cervical surgeries performed. I mean, in the United States, we're doing you know over 120,000 cases annually. We're seeing this number uh, grow, and over the years, even in my 30 years, we've seen significant improvement in technique and style. But even in even with the newer graph materials and, and newer hardware, which makes uh, the surgery more successful. Um, we still have complications and, and it's important for our uh, young uh, residents and young neurosurgeons and even more senior ones to be able to identify those complications and really try to avoid those. Uh, and in most published reports, you know, the complication rates range between, you know, three to 20% of something going wrong uh, during the case. This was a publication uh, uh, by Shan. Uh, in uh, 2016, they reviewed complications with anterior and posterior cervical spine, and, and it's the usual things that we expect to see with dysphagia being the most common uh, complaint that patients have. And I think this is more of a, uh, you know, about one third of all patients have a, a certain amount of dysphagia right after surgery. 
Um, but when uh, I've reviewed that, and one of the funny things is if you interviewed every patient, whether they were go undergoing neck surgery or, or uh, abdominal surgery, a third of them complained of dysphagia or throat pain. So this isn't always the neurosurgical problem. It's part of it as related to the anesthesia and intubation. But still about uh, you know, 10 percent, uh, three to 10 percent of those can still continue to have long-term problems swallowing. And again, the, the, we see pseudoarthrosis, graft instrumentation, hematomas, arterial injuries, and we'll address some of these uh, as we go through. This is my own experience. I did a, a, a publication uh, on a 16-year on a experience here uh, where we did over 2,000 uh, 2, patients, have done many more since then now. Uh, and this was just published in 2021. Again, we found dysphagia the most common problem with about 10% or 12% uh, having temporary dysphagia, but only about 4% after three months still reported uh, some dysphagia, um, which uh, required more of an intensive workup. Uh, second most common problem we found was graft and hardware problems and pseudoarthrosis, some nerve, nerve palsies, infections, vocal cord palsies, hematomas, dural defects, and then even esophageal tears. And, and uh, we'll also talk about maybe tracheal injuries. So, although I haven't had the, the experience of one, um, I did have a, one of my previous partners did have a, a uh, tracheal injury. I think it's important, you know, when we talk about this, you know, pre-planning and, and uh, there's steps along the way that we can do in advance, even before we make our incision. You know, fiber optic intubation is, is I think is very important in when you have severe anterior compression. If you have patients that have a significant amount of cervical myelopathy or significant stenosis, you know, I, I think a fiber optic intubation can reduce the mobility and, and uh, uh, overextension of the neck. Uh, whenever possible, doing neural monitoring can help. Um, there was, uh, I find this very useful when I was at the Cleveland Clinic we were doing neural monitoring even prior. We'd, we'd, we'd do the patients before they were even uh, put to sleep or intubated. We were placing our neural monitoring and recording uh, uh, our signals. And we found even during induction, while anesthesia was inducting the patients and we would see a drop in their blood pressure, which we often see, you know, what would seem to be a normal, you know, maybe mild hypotension but we'd see significant changes already occurring in, in our neural monitoring, which if we hadn't placed the monitoring beforehand and the patient woke up with the deficit, we would have assumed it was related to something we did surgically. But instead, it was actually due to the brief period of ischemia and low blood pressure uh, that was occurring uh, during intubation and during uh, uh, the induction of anesthesia. So. I think that's an important aspect that I always try to tell mine when I know that I have significant cord compression where the spinal cord can have um, altered flow and, and the, the, the spinal uh, blood flow will be, the, the normal autoregulation can be affected because of stenosis. I make sure I uh, try to have my uh, anesthesiologist know that maintain and keep a good uh, mean arterial pressure kind of uh, at around at least 70 or 80 uh, millimeters of mercury just to contain you know, good uh, blood, uh, blood perfusion to the cord. I think it's important to stabilize the neck, whether you use a Mayfield, uh, but more importantly, I think more from posterior aspect of it. If you're doing an anterior cervical discectomy infusion, I think it's very important to support and, and place towel rolls or some sort of support, a saline bag beneath the neck so that you're not getting excessive uh, neck motion during the exposure. Um, when a patient's paralyzed, you can see a significant amount of laxity occurring in, in simple motion and even flexion extension from, uh, by the anesthesiologist can cause uh, uh, unexpected injury. Uh, other things in planning your incision, you know, good lateral x-rays can help you tell exactly where you should be making your incision. I would typically do a, a normal midline incision, you know, horizontal, if, if I'm doing three or, or less levels, if you're going to four or higher levels, if you're going, you know, multiple levels like that, I, I think a, a longitudinal incision is, is, even though cosmetically is not the best, 
but I think it offers more, a better exposure and less traction and less likely to do injuries from trying to over retract too much into areas. And so, like I said, you can, you can see the uh, anatomy better and just uh, can avoid you know, working too far laterally is important as well. Um, one other technique I like to do is I, in placing any of my distraction pins, I really try to avoid um, uh, pounding in pins, especially in, when there's already some cord uh, compression or, or myelopathy present. I usually drill with a, with a, a small little drill and, and then screw holes all for all my distraction pins. I think that helps reduce the chance of uh, injuring the cord any further. Uh, important uh, is dissection. I mean, after you make your incision, and I take my incision all the way to the midline because I wanna be able to see the, the uh, thyrohyoid muscles and the uh, omohyoid muscles and work within that plane. As you, uh, um, there's an important cleavage plane right between the, the uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle and the uh, thyrohyoid muscles and the cervical strap muscles in there. It's so important to stay within that vascular plane. And I wanna be able to see both my borders and work in that. And I do a nice blunt dissection all the way down with my finger to get to the spine. And that way you're not uh, um, injuring any of the uh, vessels or the esophagus or the trachea. I mean, you should be able to, your finger should be able to bluntly dissect all the way down to the spine. You can work your way underneath the the trachea and underneath the uh, esophagus uh, before placing any of my retractors down deep. Uh, I like to use handhelds to expose the spine, get my level uh, identified, and then I'll mark it, and then start taking down the longest Coley muscles with simple handheld retractors before I put in uh, my permanent um, uh, self-retaining retractors. So I think self-retaining retractors provide good exposure. They free up your hands so you can do multiple things. But it's important, like I said, to get the lip of those uh, retractor blades in the longest Coley muscles and not uh, going into the other soft tissues. As I mentioned before, you know, blood pressure, uh, maintaining good blood pressure to help with uh, prevent hyperperfusion of the spinal cord is important. And use wound drains if needed. I don't typically use a wound drain unless just because of the risk of infection, but unless there, you know, I think there's excessive, you know, bleeding or worry about the concern of a, a blood vessel breaking loose, then I typically don't use a drain. But if there is any concern, go ahead and use a drain. Like I said, dysphagia, you know, is one of the number one causes, but I think, you know, that it's, it's not something I'm going to talk a lot about. I think most of the time that improves. If you have questions about that or concerns, you know, uh, a dysphagia gram or, or a swallowing study is something you can evaluate for to see if, if there's strictures um, and those patients can be referred to maybe the uh, uh, gastric enterologist. Sometimes they can dilate a, st a stenotic area. I think more of the problems that we see are, are more related to graft and hardware complications. Uh, as we know, this uh, with bone graft, we say, you know, depending on what studies you look at, there's up to, you know, 20% uh, graft or hardware complication in most studies. Uh, when I started, every th everybody got uh, uh, iliac crest harvest done, and that was 30 years ago. Now there's so many materials available that, to be used, and, and we've gotten away from it. And, you know, a tricortical uh, iliac crest graft would, is still the gold standard, but you know, because of the complication uh, associated with some of the harvesting site, we, you know, we we looked for other alternatives, and we see now that you know there's there's the bio and synthetic spacers. We have autograft, allograft, xenografts, um, all have different you know pros and cons to them, as well as carbon fiber peak cages and and, and newer titanium cages that are available. Uh, there's a nice review of uh, uh, allografts and spinal fusion that was just published in uh, 2001 here in the International Society of Advancement for Spine Surgery. You can look this up, but you can see all the different alternatives we have available. But, you know, I still think, you know, the tricortical iliac crest is the gold standard. But the key to a successful graft and incorporation and fusion are, are three things. I mean, these things haven't changed depending on, you know, uh, 
throughout the years. I mean, you need to have a, a graph material, you know, the, the ideal graph material is, has osteogenic properties, osteoinduction properties, and osteoconduction properties. And to get to get a good complete fusion is aided by, you know, the appropriate graft architecture. So you, the more your graft has these three things, the better the graft is, is, is going to be and provide, you know, the greatest chance for uh, improvement in fusion. And like I mentioned, you know, I think tricorticoid that crest is historically the gold standard and still the best thing because it it it, it has all three uh, of these capabilities. As this uh, slide summarizes, you know, uh, autograph delay crest has both the osteoconductive, osteogenic, and osteoinductive uh, capabilities. Now, bone marrow aspiration, which can be used and applied to some of the newer um, uh, materials. Uh, some of the allografts and to uh, some of the other ceramic and other materials is good because it has osteogenic capabilities as well as osteoinductive cells, uh, but it still needs an osteoconductive a, a carrier scaffolding of some sort. Uh, and then you see the other, you know, allografts have, have uh, osteoconductive capabilities, which I think a lot of people use as well as uh, an osteoinductive, but there's just no osteogenic cells. So you need to still you know, we ha you have to rely either on the patient to uh, form the bone or, you know, you can apply, like I said, some bone marrow aspiration. And then you can see the, uh, how the other um, materials uh, work. In addition to there's some newer, you know, synthetic bone materials and, and bone spacers uh, with hydroxyapatite and calcium phosphates and calcium silicates uh, that all, all have certain amount of and some degrees of osteoconductive and osteoinductive properties, which just vary. Um, in the past, we saw a lot of carbon fiber cages. They were kind of poor. I mean, they had some mild osteoconductive properties. Um, it were, was nice because they, you know, radiolucency of them, but they were really poor as far as having any kind of osteogenic uh, properties or osteoinductive, you know. Peak has, has been used quite a bit uh, because of the uh, people's interest in not having to do a uh, Iliac crest graph. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's radiographic uh, properties. And plus it's supposed to be, um, the modular elasticity is supposed to be more compatible with normal bone. The problem what we saw with a lot of peak and, and I've kind of gone away from peak unless it's, uh, coated with the titanium is that it really did, it had a lot of subsidence and really didn't have a lot of uh, osteointegration. The bone just would not form around, it formed through it. So you needed a big window and formed around it, but it never really attached. So you'd see it, a lot of shadowing. And uh, like I said, you never got a lot of osteointegration into the peak itself. And then the newer like metals, you had steel, you had titanium which has the newer porous ones seem to have a lot better uh, osteoconductive and osteoinductive properties. Um, the, the thing, the one thing to be aware of with using some of the titanium and in, over even the past when we use the steel mesh cages and, and even some hard uh, fibular strut grafts are they may be too hard for osteoporotic bone. Um, so some of them you'll get a lot of subsidence from some of the materials. So I think you really need to consider what kind of graph material you're going to be using based off of the, the type of uh, and the uh, quality of the bone in the patient that you're going to be using and the age of the patient. Um, like I said, uh, hardware and graph complication is the second most common complication. Uh, and usually I think it hard, in my experience, I see more hardware complications than actually graph complication. Um, and this increase uh, over time with the number of levels uh, with the age of patients, if, they're, if they have osteoporosis, uh, also if it's a poor mechanical construct. I mean, it's very important to, you know, read some of the material or some of the books and chapters written by people like Ed Benzel and others about, you know, biomechanics and, and uh, I think it's important in learning. And it, it was really important uh, when we first started doing a lot of these longer constructs. You know, when we were doing four, five, six level anterior constructs, I mean, it was really, you know, understanding biomechanics and the lever, levered arms was really important because of the risk of pull out and screw back out. 
And so I think reviewing that is very important and having a good understanding. But like I said, other risk factors include smokers, non steroidals uh, and, and then, like I said, even the graph material itself, if, if you pick a poor graph material, it's going to put added uh, stress onto an, uh, a plate and screw system. So uh, this is just an example here. Uh, uh, this patient was very osteoporotic. I thought I was uh, did a great job doing an anterior corpectomy. I used a, 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 a large iliac crest uh, strut graft. Uh, in this patient, there are some, you know, maybe the anterior plate was a little high, more cephalad, but I thought, oh, this is a great construction. Um, I'm not going to support, you know, have to do her posteriorly, add additional screws, and that was my mistake. She was hypermobile. I mean, she wasn't compliant with wearing her collar, and because of her soft bone, she just, you could see just um, the graft just eroded away into the uh, softer uh, cancellous bone. That put too much stress on her plate and screw system, calling it to, causing it to fall out and pull out. And we eventually had to revise her and then put in the posterior instrumentation. So uh, I think you need to be prepared and analyze and look at your results and see when, uh, you know, now if I'm doing a, 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 a construction, a reconstruction like this, I'm almost always thinking, especially in an older patient, of adding in additional uh, posterior hardware just to prevent this kind of uh, problem from occurring again. Um, some just to, to little pearls and tricks you learn, and this is, you know, nothing new, but, you know, I think it's real important, you can see here, to, uh, we all get excited about doing the discectomy and getting a good decompression, preparing our end plates, but before we apply our plates, it's real important to get down uh, and, and drill down the anterior osteophytes just to try to get back to the normal level so that you can see and so that the plates can lie flush. I mean, nothing's worse than when you get your post-operative x-ray and you see a big gap like uh, shown here in the diagram between the bone interface. Plus you're not getting as much of the, the, uh, the screw into the, the good strong bone. So I, I think, you know, try to get flush. And then a lot of these patients you'll see have large anterior osteophytes and, and I try to drill them down to try to get them as flush as possible before applying the plates. Uh, another thing with the plates is, is to, you know, if they need a little bend, you know, if you want to try to get a little more lordosis, you have to bend the plates. Uh, a lot of the plates now have some built-in lordosis, uh, but also it's the sizing of the plate. I mean, I try to do as small a plate as possible I don't want to see like in the, this diagram where the top of the plate is too close to the to adjacent level. This has been shown to cause adjacent disease. Uh, and also that you run the risk of getting your screws going through the bone and then into the adjacent disc space. So these are just little points. I mean, you know, you're tired, you're at the end of the day, oh, let's get a plate on and screw it in. But it's important to take uh, time at this point to make sure you're sizing your, your plate properly drilling down the end plates and, uh, and the osteophytes and, and making sure you get the proper fitting plate. Uh, because these are all things you can see. You can get uh, screw pull out and fractures. Uh, screws can be malpositioned. One of the, the key points is if you're trying to overangulate uh, past the locking mechanisms. A lot of these uh, plates have uh, locking mechanisms which either twist over or they're like spring loaded. Uh, locking mechanisms to retain the screw and prevent it from backing out. But if you have any, any kind of part of the screw, like in, in, in this diagram here, which shows some of these heads are past the locking mechanism, they can back out and, and then the screws will loosen. So I think that the more um, perpendicular you can place and make sure that, that the screw heads are past the locking mechanism and don't try to overangulate your screws, you know, you want to get them as much perpendicular as possible. And again, that comes down to proper plate uh, selection and size. So um, to prevent uh, too much stress put on the screws or on the, the plates, which can then fracture. Uh, and graft, again, you have you run into complications with uh, graft mal malpositioning graft fractures, uh, absorption of graft paint, depending on the material with pseudoarthrosis and subsidence. Again, malpositioned grafts, if you if you graft, you don't 
uh, here are some examples. The, the top uh, right image shows uh, the graft uh, the cage is out too proudly and, and, uh, and part of that, uh, it's not seated as far posteriorly as you'd like to see it. Uh, in the uh, MRI below on the left, lower left, you can see where part of the cage or graft is, is pushed too far posteriorly, where it goes into the canal, patient can have, uh, wakes up with worsening symptoms or, or worsening radiculopathy. You really need to evaluate and make sure that, you have, that your graft hasn't migrated. When I was using a lot of um, autograft bone, or, or I mean allograft bone, some of the, the, the consistency of some of these bones, it was very friable, even though you would rehydrate some of these, uh, when you pounded it in, you can see it kind of fracture or crack. And so you have to be careful when you're using those type of materials of, of allograft bone uh, and even some of the other new hydroxyapatites and other uh, calcium silicates and phosphates that have, uh, these structural allografts um, can, they are uh, uh, not as strong as like a metal cage. And, and so you have to be careful that they can fracture and you can't see what's happening behind. You have to be aware that they could be hitting up against uh, a, a stronger bone that can cause a, a fracture and can migrate backwards. So you've got to be aware of that. And then there's also just the malpositioning of your graft. You know, if you don't position or, or prepare your end plates correctly, and then you've just put the graft in, and the, the cage and, uh, and graft material will not sit properly. And that can lead to further uh, subsidence and problems and too much stress on your, your plates. Um, subsidence is a problem. You see this a lot with osteoporosis. I think also, you get, like I said, you have to be aware of your, how hard your graft material is. You know, fibrillar bone can be very strong, a strong cortical bone. And, and if you're overzealous with your, your end plate preparation and you get it too much into the uh, cortical cancellous bone and you put a hard fibula bone or metal or even peak, I've seen significant subsidence and it, it almost acts like a bore and drills into the soft bone. And you can see that in the top example where the graft's kind of uh, subsided and, and gone into more into the cancellous bone. And same way with that lower strut graft, it just kind of can fracture and break right into it. And then you, when this happens, then it puts abnormal stress onto your, your plates and screws, and that can cause the screws to fracture, the plates to fracture or to pull out. Um, Another important feature is, is your, the graft size. I think I try to get in as big a graft as possible to try to cover as much of the uh, cortical end plates. I think the larger your surface area, the, the greater uh, support that it provides. And if we know the weakest part of the bone and the end plates is in the center. So the further we can get away from the center and, and more into the apophyseal ring, it provides greater support and it's the strongest area. So you're going to have less likely um, uh, to get subsidence with that. So like I said, there's a lot of, of planning and, and uh, things to consider uh, when constructing multi-level uh, anterior cervical discectomy fusions you need to be aware of and, and, and to take into consideration. So uh, you can get absorption and fracture. We see a lot is higher in, like I said, in, in the allografts and osteoporotic uh, autografts. When a patient has oste uh, osteoporotic bone, we can see some uh, uh, absorption. And, and then this can, uh, again, also lead to subsidence and uh, uh, further problems with the hardware. You see a lot of it with smokers, uh, steroids, and uh, even BMP. One of the things they found with uh, uh, bone morphogenic protein in the early days was uh, people used to throw this in there all the time and think, oh, this is great. We're going to get bony formation. But one of the one of the early uh, things with the bone, uh, bone morphogenic protein is it causes uh, uh, osteolysis. And so it would cause a lot of breakdown of the grass material before it formed new bone. And then that would, could lead to problems. So again, you get uh, malabsorption when the end plates are prepared poorly, or if there's excessive motion, you know, too much uh, motion. Uh, if you just, we, we learned this from, when we just used to put in uh, allograft alone in there by itself without a plate or screw, we saw a lot of breakdown of those allografts and uh, it, it just would not, you didn't get the same amount of uh, stress shielding on, on those grafts and they would break down. 
Uh, pseudoarthrosis, again, I think a lot of that comes down to uh, excessive motion, but also the, the materials like you see a peak cage in here, uh, even though bone can grow through it, it really doesn't attach or, or goes around it. Um, several things with this uh, 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 picture here that you can see wrong. Uh, uh, the plate is too long. You see it going all the way up to the uh, disc space above and below. So this was a poorly uh, uh, sized plate. You see, you know, it's subside or pseudoarthrosis around the graft. There's uh, and uh, the screw positions are good. They're not at a good, you know, perpendicular. But again, there's several things going on with this uh, plate and screw system that could have been better. The newer coatings and the porous titanium, we're seeing kind of more osteo integration with these uh, uh, that they're coating peak with, and I think this will help with some of that problem. So it's important to consider proper graft selection with a large surface area to prevent subsidence. So that to me is one of the key take home points with just about taking for, for the graft material itself. We always try to restore lower doses when possible. Um, they, they, a lot of the grafts now are, have built in lower doses, which can help out. Or if you're still harvesting bone, you know, you can shape and, and graft and put in some lower doses right into your graft. Uh, you want to optimize fusion to prevent stress on the hardware over time. Like I said, use grafts with osteogenic, osteoinductive, and osteoconductive properties whenever possible. And consider, I think I've switched a lot more now to uh, multiple smaller single level constructs now that they are creating those over the long plate constructs. Like what we see here, I almost don't do this anymore. Here's an example kind of before and after. Here's a, a patient with C3 through you know, T1 problems with multiple disc protrusions. You know, it's debatable, do you do this patient to the front or to the back? Uh, 20 years ago, I would have done this, you know, all through the front. I would have, uh, you know, done multi-level ACDS and then uh, flip the patient and put in hardware from the back. Now what I'm doing now is doing these smaller sort of mini uh, uh, plates and screws with, at each level. And I feel like I can get restored just as much of the lower doses. Uh, in the cervical spine, as you can see here, because you can individually uh, work at each level and uh, don't require, I don't feel like it needs the posterior instrumentation as much because of uh, just, I think you can get better screw placement and doesn't require the posterior fusion. But because those long anterior plates just would have such a high failure rate from uh, either snapping or screw pull out because we were just putting too much stress on such a long lever arm you know, a lot of the times. But uh, other problems that we see, I'm going to review, uh, uh, I think one of the more common things that happens in, you know, one to three percent of patients that can get the, the C5 nerve palsy. I know some reports say much more common from a posterior approach, but I, I see it, you know, I've seen it quite frequently from anterior. Uh, the etiology of this, I think, is still very debatable. Um, we're not sure is this due to vascular ischemia. Uh, I think that's one of the main causes because, like I mentioned before, we were doing uh, nerve monitoring prior to patients, especially at all any patient we were doing at the C45 level uh, that had stenosis and we were operating on. We were doing neural monitoring before the patients were being uh, put to sleep. And uh, so we, we had good baselines and then at, during the induction and if the pressure dropped, we would begin to see uh, lo losing our signals of the C5 nerve root in, and developing deficits uh, due to hypotension or a drop in the, in the mean arterial pressure. So I think a lot of C5 nerve palsies are due to some sort of vascular event. Uh, there's also you know, some stretching, I think based off of positioning and the same thing, could the stretching just be causing um, compression of some of the feeding vessels um, going to the nerve? Um, because we know it, it's kind of at the level where it gets, uh, it has the porous uh, uh, blood supply, it's, it's in a watershed area. And so it's receiving blood supply from uh, two different areas. And so it, it's at a much higher risk of uh, getting a vascular event. But I think also from contusion, uh, thermal injury, I think cauterizing, be careful, you know, I don't cauterize around the nerve. Um, uh, I'll just try to use uh, 
other hemostatic agents and stuff to try to stop any bleeding in that area. Um, so I think to avoid excessive traction, I don't tape shoulders down anymore. I just, or tape shoulders down just slightly just to take some of the, the skin uh, um, folds out. Um, I don't uh, coagulate around the, the nerves at all. I just use uh, more hemostatic agents. Uh, you know, you can use gel foam and thrombin soak gel foam or some of the flow seals are all available, which work very well. Maintaining, you know, good systolic blood pressure, mean arterial pressure, I think is important. You know, do neural monitoring whenever possible. You know, not every place has it, but, and like I said, I don't use it for all of my ACDFs, but if I'm working at C4-5, I like to do neural monitoring or higher just because of that risk. Or if there's really severe uh, cord compression or myelopathy already present, I would like to do neural monitoring. Like I said, most C5 nerve palsies will recover with that, you know, six months or more, but they will require physical therapy. I do start some of them on steroids when this occurs, but you want to make sure also, you know, get repeat imaging to make sure that they don't uh, have something uh, uh, causing compression, like a, a, either a poor decompression or additional dysmaterial is migrated. So it's important to get imaging to make sure that that hasn't happened. Uh, and I've seen this happen develop in patients even after surgery, like two to three days. So I, I warn my patients, I tell them, uh, you know, that, that patients will come in a week later and say they just started suddenly getting weak. And uh, so tell them that it's, it's a risk or it can be, occur even after, even after the surgery is completed a few days later. Um, that goes back to kind of worsening neurologic symptoms from, you know, uh, I think one thing is, you'll see a patient wakes up and they're having a lot of dysesthetic pain and maybe have uh, almost like a central cord syndrome, even though you, you've done a good surgery, uh, good decompression. Uh, I think this sometimes occurs, it's kind of a rare event, but I think it's due to hyperemia post decompression. You know, you have poor uh, autoregulation of the spinal cord and from chronic compression of the anterior spinal artery. And when you take that pressure off, uh, the spinal cord, you'll suddenly, you don't have the same uh, autoregulation. I think you can get some hyperemia and cause the spinal cord to swell and even get maybe even minor uh, kind of contusions within the, the spinal cord itself. And that can cause uh, central cord uh, type syndrome. Um, I said, uh, but important thing first is to kind of get your repeat your imaging, make sure that there isn't a cause for the worsening, like making sure your screws and grafts are all in good position and not causing compression. Um, and I think those are important. So uh, oftentimes I just treat them for a few days with steroids and then treat them with uh, some of the neuropathic pain medications like uh, gabapentin uh, to help with the pain. Most of the time, this seems to improve uh, uh, with time. Uh, other uh, more common uh, complications are infections. Uh, in my experience, the most, the most common cause, the neck is a very good uh, uh, blood supply and really uh, infections, you don't see a lot of infections in the neck. You may get superficial wound infections if the wound hisses a bit, but, but severe uh, infections and abscesses are rare, except for in the diabetic patients or patients who've had previous staph infections, osteomyelitis that were poorly treated or undertreated with uh, inappropriate antibiotics. Some also report the higher risk with the length of surgery. I mean, most of my surgeries only last, you know, one to two hours at most anymore. So it, it's, it, that has not been an issue, but for longer constructions where they were going three to four hours, uh, they've been shown maybe that the length of the surgery plays a factor. But I think uh, I avoid drains, except for unless there's a really some risk of uh, additional bleeding or, or the patient just seems to be more oozing, uh, do good irrigation with that. I use uh, irrigation with uh, antibiotics in it. Uh, and then I also place uh, vancomycin powder in all my uh, wounds just to help with uh, re reducing the chance of infection. Uh, we do uh, pre-op hemoclins or so, uh, uh, a um, uh, chlorhexidine wash and prep on all of our necks and have the patient do that the day before for bathing to reduce the the colonization on their skin. And like I said, for treating these, um, you don't always have to, if, you, if you've got nothing but metal in place, 
I think you can treat and sterilize titanium. I, and I've done this in several cases where I haven't taken my plates and screws out if I have a metal cage in there and, and plates and screws, but it does require six to eight weeks of, of IV antibiotics. Now, if you've used allograft or other type of materials, I do think in those cases, you need to basically take everything out, take your screws and plates out, your, your grafts out, uh, wash everything out very well. And then I will go in, then that's when I replace it. I won't put uh, uh, allograft bone in there just because that can act as a carrier or anything else, but I'll use titanium uh, cages at that point, titanium plates and screws. You know, if the patient, you know, if you can leave everything out, that's one thing, but if you have to, the, if the patient's unstable and you have to stable, restabilize them, then I think you can use titanium. But like I said, it's going to require uh, six to eight weeks of IV antibiotics. And I put vancomycin powder in there. And you, you can leave a drain in for one to two days to get to help uh, remove any additional uh, infection drainage. But that's how I typically treat these type of infections when they occur. Uh, hematomas occur. Uh, it can result from either peripheral bleeders, or, which kind of break loose to patient coughs or sneezes, and they can break loose a little peripheral uh, blood vessel, which may have been cauterized during surgery. Uh, I've also seen uh, big hematomas form uh, from overzealous uh, end plate preparation. If you're getting too much into the, uh, the uh, cancellous bone that's, that's bleeding a lot, and that's when I was using grafts that had a hollow center. I wasn't putting anything inside. Now I, now I put in some, uh, uh, some, BM, uh, some uh, demineralized bone matrix or something else that I pack into those cages. But when it was just the, the cage itself, which was hollow, the blood would just come out and it, and it wouldn't, wasn't being tamponaded by the uh, graft material. And uh, you just get bleeding coming from the end plates of the bone and that can form a hematoma in the neck. Uh, so I think I, I make sure I don't, uh, uh, get too overzealous with my end plate preparation and make sure the, the wound bed is dry. You know, you got to have good hemostasis, uh, place a drain if there's any concern for 12 to 24 hours. And, and if a patient starts getting any airway compromise, you, you got to plan for emergency, emergent evacuation of that hematoma. I've done uh, a couple of these, even just at the bedside of patients starting to get airway compromise. Um, you just get a scalpel and do it right there at the bedside, get the hematoma out, and then take them to the operating room. Tell you, uh, as I've seen that as they're, they're calling a code on these patients and trying to intubate, the anesthesiologist or the ER doctor is, has a hard time intubating these patients because of the shift that's occurring from the hematoma. So if you can open it up and remove the hematoma beforehand, and you can even help guide them as they're trying to intubate these patients. One of, one of the few uh, esophageal tears that I've seen was during an intubation of a patient with a hematoma as the anesthesiologist could not get the tube in or was very aggressive and, and perforated the uh, esophagus uh, that, while trying to get a patient intubated uh, who had a hematoma. So that's why I said I try to recommend early. I mean, it's easy once you take the hematoma out, you can irrigate it, put a drain in, and keep these patients on some antibiotics. So vascular injuries, although they don't happen very often, you have to be aware of them. Um, you know, the, the, the three ones that are most common, you have carotid uh, artery. Key there is don't even get close to the carotid. I mean, you should be working uh, really uh, medial to the carotid artery in, in, the, uh, in that avascular tissue plane. Uh, avoid putting your retractors in, into the soft tissue, really get it down deeper into the uh, longest coli muscles. I use blunt retractors. I don't, you know, my retractor, self retractor retractor blades are all blunt, so I don't have any sharp retractor blades. Um, the vertebral artery usually gets injured during, um, while you're doing the uh, discectomy and, and, and foraminotomy and decompression. If you get too far out laterally past the, the uncinate uh, processes, you, you run the risk of getting into uh, the vertebral artery. Always review your MRI or CT just to check, kind of see where that vertebral artery is, if there's any anomalies or, or, or if it's passing close to your disc space or nerve roots so that you, you're aware of those at that level. So when you're, when you're doing your dissection and there's always the small superficial uh, draining uh, veins and vessels 
of the thyroid branches coming off. Uh, uh, I try to preserve them as much as possible, but if they're really in your way and you're having to stretch or and run the risk of tearing them, I, I just carefully, I just tie them off and I and, and sacrifice them as needed for a better exposure. Um, other post-surgical complications, you got the esophageal. Like I said, I've seen three esophageal uh, perforations, all kind of were the result. Uh, two were from intubation uh, during, uh, and the other was from an infection that had eroded through the esophagus. And during the reoperation, you get the, the esophagus. So you had a, a prevertebral abscess, and the esophagus was so uh, worn and friable that it had a perforation in it. Um, the tracheal injury, like I said, I had a, one uh, uh, partner who had suffered, they had a tracheal injury, not quite sure uh, how, it, how it happened, but they think that it was probably due to the retractor slipping up and causing, and they used uh, uh, sharp retractors and may have injured the, the trachea. So you got to be aware of that. Like I said, watch your blades, make sure they don't migrate. Those are all important things. Um, that's why I do like that. Use handheld retractors carefully, getting all the way down to the anterior spine, and then gently retract immediately, uh, and then get the blades lot uh, situated or fixed un under that uh, longus coli muscles. Uh, and it's important not to get lost. So you can get lost in there. There's almost always a nice cleavage plane, an avascular cleavage plane. You can get right down to the anterior spine. But when you're first beginning, it's, it's you're either, if you work too far laterally, you'll get into the sternocleidomastoid muscle and you'll be uh, lateral to that. And then you're dissecting down into the carotid artery uh, or, and into the uh, internal jugular area. So uh, you'll get lost there. If you work too far medially, then you'll get into the sternohyoid and omohyoid muscles. Uh, so you need to stay within that cleavage plane. That's why I make my, my uh, incision all the way to midline so I know where that's at. But then I, I, I work, uh, just make sure I stay in that cleavage plane that uh, between those two muscle layers, between the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the sternohyoid and the omohyoid muscles. Um, like I said, use blunt retractors. Now, if you do have to, to uh, repair these, you, you need to repair them uh, right away. So if these occur uh, for the esophageal tears, you can over sew those, you just, uh, with some non-absorbable sutures. Uh, and then I also do, then uh, do a muscle flap. You can take part of the, the omohyoid muscle or part of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and put a muscle flap over the defect and that helps uh, provide blood supply and can help with the repair and, and reducing the infection. Um, same way with the uh, uh, tracheal uh, damage. And then uh, usually you'll need to pass a feeding tube. You want, you want these, uh, these areas to heal up well before uh, you, you, you let the patients do a lot of uh, eating and swallowing. So you pass a feeding tube and maybe um, uh, feed them uh, with the feeding tube for several weeks. Uh, and then I keep them on antibiotics as well, IV antibiotics for at least uh, uh, two, two to three weeks. And they may switch to some oral antibiotics just to prevent uh, uh, your wound from getting infected until it's healed up well. Uh, another problem is uh, dural defects. These can really be a problem. And uh, I've, in my experience, it usually occurs in a re-operation. I'm, I'm going in to take or uh, repair somebody else's operation. They've developed a uh, new, new uh, compression. You see it in uh, OPLL uh, and also where you, or you, where you can have significant osteophytes that have caused some bony erosion into the dura. And it's very thin as you're removing that uh, calcifications, uh, you, you end up finding you have a defect in, in CSF leak. Uh, sometimes also I'm seeing them now with, uh, from you can get a CSF leak or a dural defect from uh, a lot of pain management procedures where they're doing transforaminal uh, approaches or and maybe off a little bit that they can damage or get uh, puncture the, the dura and you can get some CSF leaking around um, through the nerve root sleeve or from the dura from, from even from the pain management procedures causing a, a puncture of the, of the dura. I tell you, they're very difficult to repair. I almost can never get them 
fully repaired. So you usually you just have to, to, to place a, a patch or a graft. Now, usually we'll either use some fat, uh, some people use a piece of muscle or, or a collagen uh, material. Uh, and then uh, I usually use some uh, fibrum glue. So I'll lay a, a collagen graft across the defect, uh, the whole defect. You don't want it too small, otherwise it'll fall into a defect. But I, I place it all the way across the, the full length of the disc space add a little layer of fiber and glue. And then I still put my graft um, in there to basically bolster and hold that uh, patch in place. Um, and that usually works. I mean, I, I, in, in most cases, I've never had to reoperate on, on, a, on a CSF uh, or a dural defect or a CSF leak. Uh, if, in some cases, I've had other people report then that they do still have a problem with leakage. And if they develop a pseudomeningocele, you may want to consider placing, you know, after the repair, or if you have to go back in and repair it again, then consider placing maybe a lumbar drain to help take some of the pressure off and uh, do that for three to five days and allow that to scar in and heal up a little bit better. Just a consideration. Uh, other things, uh, vocal cord palsies, there's a lot of literature uh, uh, talks about this, you know, happens in one to 3%. Is it due to direct injury to the nerve through your dissection, or is it secondary compression from the retractors? That's why it's important, I think, to get those retractor blades down deep into the longest coli. Don't let it get into the soft tissues or where it could be compressing the nerve. Um, uh, if you're doing the longer surgery, I think um, releasing um, the retractors once in a while uh, to allow so that there's not too much traction injury. Also, there's a Talk about uh, deflating your endotracheal balloon and then reinflating so that the, it uh, doesn't put as much pressure uh, along the sides of the, of the trachea and, and compressing some of the, the, uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerves. And there's also, you know, a higher risk on when you do a right side approach. I'm a right hand surgeon. I do all my ACDFs on the right side. So, but uh, you just have to be aware that that is uh, a risk. But so a lot of people just advocate going on to the left side. Um, most of the time, if it's a simple hoarseness, these improve over time. But if it's a permanent uh, vocal cord palsy and, uh, and uh, here's those intro people, ENT doctors can go in and look, they can uh, then do a, a, a vocal cord injection where they put some silicate into the, the vocal cord and, and push it over and, and then that can restore the voice. Uh, and that happens, you know, have to do that in about 1% of the patients. Uh, OPLL can be a special problem, as, you know, and, it, and, and there's, uh, it's difficult and controversial on how to uh, approach and direct these, uh, operate on these patients. Um, you know, in, in most cases, it was taught in the, to go posterior in these cases to uh, just do a decompression laminectomy. I find, uh, I mean, the, the problem is anterior, so I try to address the, the, the problem where it's at. So if, the, if I see the pathology is anterior, I'm going to do an anterior approach. If the, if the problem is posterior, I do a posterior approach. But uh, there are safe ways that you can uh, perform and operate on OPLL with certain technique, techniques which um, reduce the chances of damaging it. Uh, here's one uh, that I know I learned from uh, some of my uh, Asian uh, colleagues, and it's it's a way to minimize pressure on the cord. You can thin down, thin down the uh, calcifications and the OPLL ligament, and then you you can break it up and, and uh, lift it up, get a small little uh, nerve hook or needle, lift up an edge of it, pull it away from the cord, so when you're drilling, you're not putting too much pressure on. And also, if you can thin it out, and even you can leave it. A thin layer of the calcified uh, posterior longitudinal ligament, just section it into many small pieces so that it, it that it will still float and 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 reticulate and move without causing compression. So you need to thin down the the calcification, try to break it up into multiple segments, and lift it away from the cord as you're trying to do your drilling. Um, and and this is just a case again. Here here is a patient with. Uh, you see here with the four, five, five, six osteophytes cord compression, you know, what's the approach to use? Do you go anterior or posterior? Because to me, all the pathology is, is anterior, I would do, I would have done an anterior approach in this, where some people in the past would only do a posterior approach. 
so you can good, get a good decompression. You can put a corpectomy cage in. You can you know stabilize these without all through the front, and you don't have to go to the back with some of these if you use you know uh, good technique and, and a good strategy. So some of the take home messages. Uh, everyone will get complications. I've had them. I've had lots of them, you know, unfortunately. Um, uh, but you got to be ready for them. You know, with proper planning and good surgical technique, you can reduce a lot of them and, and prevent many of them. But I think you always need to be in the back of your mind. Be, be aware that complications can occur. Be prepared to address them. So uh, always make sure you have a backup plan. What happens if this occurs? What happens if a screw backs out? What, what are my other options that you have available? So always have, uh, uh, be prepared to address those complications if they do occur. So that's my advice and uh, hopefully it helps you out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Robertson. Uh, I really much enjoyed your lecture because I think uh, and I think uh, most of um, all of us uh, did as well, because in my opinion, we can learn much more from complications uh, uh, rather than, you know, presentations about uh, successfully managed complex cases. Uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for your advices. Um, I think uh, there are, uh, there will be many questions uh, about uh, uh, what you said. I have some and maybe I can, I can start with my questions and then I will leave uh, the audience uh, uh, to, to have some questions as well. So um, sometimes uh, we have uh, um, a severe stenosis, cer cervical stenosis uh, due to both anterior compression and posterior spondylosis. Uh, in, in these cases, especially uh, in elderly people, uh, some surgeons prefer a posterior approach uh, because uh, with the anterior approach, you know, in the positioning of a patient, you can uh, extend too much the neck and uh, have a worsening of spinal cord compression. So I would like to, uh, to know your opinion about this. So about switching from anterior to posterior uh, approach in these selected cases. Uh, also, I would like your opinion about the use of uh, uh, distraction pins uh, uh, instead of a spreader uh, to, to make your way into the, uh, the disc space. Uh, some people think that uh, pins uh, uh, can damage uh, the bone, so they prefer the spreader uh, just to, to spread uh, the end plates. Uh, and the final question is, do you always uh, use a plate when you do a CDF uh, or it depends on the pathology, on the situation? Yeah, those are all good questions. So to address the first one, I, you know, it, it uh, is, all patient independent, but a patient that has a lot of both anterior and posterior um, pathology, um, it depends on the amount of anterior pathology and the neuroframen. Because I still feel if you just do a posterior approach and there's a lot of large anterior osteophytes or, or far lateral discs, even if you do a posterior decompression, you're, those patients are still going to have a lot of symptoms. And I just don't think you, you, you're going to run into the problem that we've learned for years with just a, like a, even though the, the laminoplasties are better, but when we do posterior laminectomies and, and, and fixate them, you would still, uh, even if you try to restore low doses with your posterior alone fixation around a, neuro, a narrow neural frame and with a large anterior ostophyte, these patients would not get better. And then there's still a risk of you have an anterior pathology compressing on the anterior spinal artery, uh, which I think is the most crucial thing. And, and so I would still, almost in every case, do an anterior decompression. I keep them in a more neutral position. I don't try to overflex them too much. So I'll keep them, I let their neck kind of go where it's at and just move, make my incision and, and go with a neutral neck position and not extend them too much during the anterior approach. Do my decompression try to restore the lower doses from the front. And if I feel like I'm gonna then have to still do something posteriorly, then I flip them over and do my posterior approach. But I think it's really important. The, the one 
downside to doing stuff posteriorly alone is 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 just not getting an adequate decompression of, of stuff from the front. Um, you know, the theory is the nerves are going to float away, away from the disc, but that, that isn't always the case. If you have too much bony osteophytes and, and they're, they're already rigid or fixed, the, the nerves are being stretched across those uh, neural foramen and, and across the osteophytes and disc, and they're still going to be symptomatic. So I, I still, I'm just a firm believer in doing as much from the front as possible, just because I'm very comfortable doing that. Uh, second uh, question about distraction pins. Yeah, I use distraction pins because so many times I do multi multi level distraction or ACDFs, and it just speeds up my um, workflow. So I can put in pins at multiple levels. An important thing is to always wax your holes afterwards. So like if you do do distraction pins, make sure you wax the pins and wax the holes afterwards. because That can be a source of a hematoma when you take those out. But yes, there is a, you know, the, the small amount of screw damage that you're doing, you're doing it typically in the middle of the, the vertebrae. It's really not causing much of a problem. Uh, I found it always hard to work around the spreaders and I couldn't, you know, you're either putting them in and then you're trying to drill around it. And I just didn't feel like, and then trying to get a graft around through the spreader just made it seem more cumbersome so just for my ease of use and for speed I can just go through and, and do all three or four levels and then just drop my graphs in and not have to worry so much about working around the spreader but I mean there's nothing wrong with um, using a spreader versus distraction pin I'm sorry what was your third question it was about the plate if you always oh, yeah. place a plate or not Pretty much now, I mean, because um, I think a young person, I think I almost always use a plate now because now if I'm doing a young person, a single level, say where you normally would maybe consider doing just a simple discectomy and a graft with no plate, those patients now are probably more candidates for an artificial disc. Uh, we know that the plates help provide and improve the fusion rate. Uh, so, it, and the one thing it can help with is also patients not having to wear a collar. So many patients are non-compliant and don't wear collars, or even though you tell them to. I put in a plate now just so even on a single level, if, if, if I'm uh, doing these patients, and because then they can just have to wear a collar, maybe just for comfort or to, to prevent, but I know they're not going to be compliant. And so it just helps, I think, with the fusion rate, um, unless, I, you know, so I'll either still always do a plate even with a single level just because I know most patients aren't compliant and wearing their collars and it's going to help the fusion rate. But if, it, if it's really just a single level which you think, oh, I could just do a discectomy, then those patients you may want to just consider doing an artificial disc. Hopefully that addressed everything. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, is there any other question? Yes, issue, please. And also Heba later, okay. Women first, Heba. All right, <laughs> thank you. Um, all right, I have to two questions. Uh, you had the mentioned about the difference between a short segment fixation and long segment fixation, and then you use like a multiple uh, mini plates between uh, the two levels, right? So, and then you ended up like using uh, more screws, like around six, 16 screws in the short mini segments than the other one. So do you think it's, it's really uh, worth it to, to have all those uh, screws in it and doesn't uh, affect the adjacent segments uh, because of uh, it might, might be considered like a more mobile segments uh, instead of a long uh, plate. And the second question is about uh, drilling the osteophytes or a calcified disc. Uh, sometimes uh, I think uh, you can have a thin plate uh, kept and instead of removing it from the dura maybe this will decrease the incidence of a tear or do you think it's uh, it's worth it to actually try to remove it and that's it yeah both good questions and uh, let me address the that your your second one first yes i mean it's like i said you don't always if you can at least thin down the, the calcification back there and and maybe even just get it to where it can fracture or break even if it can float or move it can move away from the uh, dura as long as there's nothing pushing because if, if you've thinned it down and there's nothing now pushing that small calcification into the spinal canal 
I think the normal pulsation of the spinal fluid can push it back away from the nerve and away from the spinal cord. So I think it's safe to leave a small amount of calcification as long as you can see there's some pulsation and it's thin enough to where it's not attached to anything rigid that's still keeping it there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and with the, some of the mini, uh, newer mini plates, and that's why I still use a plate, some of the newer uh, mini plate constructs are, you really are only using kind of, they're still, some of them have two holes, so they're two hole plates. And so you're still putting the same, the, the same number of screws in theory as you would if you're doing a long plate and putting two screws at each level. So I'm, I'm not sure if the screws, uh, the number of screws are, are changing, but the nice thing about them is they're right next to the end plate and you're, you're putting your screw right into the hardest part of the cortical cancellous bone. Now I use a, a system where the, the plate itself is, is, is right next to the end plate. Many of the system or the screws, the screws go more into the center, into the can, can, cortical cancellous bone. I like the ones that are a little more proud and actually are engaging into the anterior part of the cortex and the very end of the of the end plate there and, and get in there. And those plates are maybe one to two millimeters um, above the disc space. And so you're not really worried about it as much adjacent segment disease. Like I said, you can actually individually build up and can I think you can restore the lower doses better because you're 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 changing each individual level. It's, screws are the same number but you're, you're not putting a, a larger fixed uh, plate on that has a, a higher risk of pulling screw out or, or fracturing just because the construct and, and the tension that's put on the screws and the plate are so much smaller, so. All right, thank you. Uh, issue? Yeah, uh, thank you for the wonderful lecture, Professor. And, uh, um, my, my question is about the OPLL cases, uh, like uh, they, they are very tough to deal when we go uh, from the anterior approach and there are high chances of duratier. Uh, there are some recommendations that with posterior approach, even fixation of uh, cervical spine, that can later cause uh, reabsorption of the OPLL segment. And uh, it, there, there is one paper from uh, Professor Atul Goel about uh, uh, fixation of the posterior uh, spine uh, uh, from the posterior side and uh, that led to the resorption of the uh, OPLL and uh, later on the decompression of cord uh, in a better way. Uh, what's your comment about this? Yeah, I mean, I think there is some good literature out there and I'm not saying uh, that you can't go posteriorly and, and doing a decompression. I think it depends on the severity and the symptoms of each patient. Like I say, if they're having a lot of radiculopathy, it's, it's the myelopathy versus radiculopathy that's also associated with it. I, I just think if they're having a significant amount of radiculopathy is in addition to the myelopathy, if you're just having more central uh, calcification and a central uh, compression uh, and you don't feel comfortable going anteriorly and, and, and getting it all off and you can try and then leave something and then you can certainly go posteriorly do a decompression, stabilize them, and that can and see if that there is some resorption of that. I mean, we, we do know that that can occur. But I think if, if you're having um, more neuroforaminal narrowing and significant compression of the nerve roots, you're not going to, that's still not going to, the posterior approach is still not going to take care of that and, and fixating it and, and restoring their lower doses posteriorly can cause and stretch those nerves even more. So, but I'm not, I'm not advocating only anterior. I, I mean, if you have good results posteriorly, then, then you know, continue that. So. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Hey, that's, a, that's, one, that's a very important point you mentioned, Professor. I really like that. Uh, later on, I, I will uh, fall, start following this trend that radicular versus myelopathy because radiculopathy can be treated in a better way from the anterior side and myelopathy can be treated in cases of OPLL from posterior side. Thank you, Professor. I also see Adi raised his hand. Thank you, Professor Robertson for this outstanding lecture from your great experience. Uh, since my colleagues have already asked a couple of questions, which I'm also interested in, 
I have uh, two other questions. Uh, how long do you advise the patient to wear a soft collar after the surgery? How long is the plate? Uh, from my small experience, I had a couple of patients with a malposition in terms of the AP uh, X-rays. There is a like slight uh, the, uh, angle, maybe 15 degrees angle to the usually, uh, since I also do from the right side, it's usually to the left side. So uh, from your experience, uh, does it uh, influence the final outcome? Uh, if you have slight mal rotation of the plate in a two level ACDF, thank you. Oh, those are great questions and, and I've, in my experience, I've had a lot of very ugly plates on the AP view that looked angled. And I really don't think, um, and I think part of the reason why I learned from it was I wasn't drilling down the osteophytes or you're trying to, you know, there would be an osteophyte formation that which pushed your plate away as you're uh, placing it on. And so I'm much better. My plates have gotten straighter over the last 30 years, but because I, I take the time to drill down the osteophytes, try to get a little more flush. But I think if you've got good screw purchase and 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 uh, good construct, the, the small angulation, 5, 10, 15 degrees is not going to change that because it's it's a fix. And and you're not, if you're not getting motion, I think that a little variation in the plate angle is not going to change it. You're going to still get a good fusion. Um, as far as wearing collars, I, it's changed a lot. I mean, we used to everybody had to wear a collar for three months when we when I started 30 years ago. Or now uh, with the with the plates and screws, um, some people don't have people wear collars at all. I give a patient a collar and I tell them to wear it if when they're up and moving around for the first couple of weeks, uh, and just as more of a precaution and just to uh, to provide some support. Uh, but uh, if, if for a single level, they don't really need a collar or even for a two level. I think if you've got a good construct in there and feel like their bone quality is good, they don't need a collar. But uh, it's a case by case basis on, on an older patient with osteoporosis and I'm concerned even on a single level, I'll make them wear a collar for six weeks or three months and check and get my x-rays. Uh, so I think it really depends on how how well you feel the screw and the bone purchases and the age of the patient and, and if they have a, a propensity for osteoporosis. I think I would make them wear the collar just to reduce that mobility and to reduce this tension put on the and stress put on the screws in the plate system. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think we are uh, running out of time. So we had so many questions. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Robertson, for the very insightful presentation and for answering so many questions. Uh, I now want to leave the floor to uh, Professor Bishnoi for the introduction of our next speaker. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, so I would invite our next speaker, Dr. Heba Azuz. She is a lady neurosurgeon from New Cairo, Egypt, and uh, currently she is working as uh, at Cairo University Hospital as a neurosurgery assistant lecturer and pursuing PhD degree. And she is also working at Cancer Child Hospital Foundation as neurosurgery registrar. And uh, she has been the first female neurosurgeon from Anshams University Hospital, Egypt. And uh, she has uh, attended many courses and uh, she has done some medical volunteering at, uh, in Operation Smile, Tahrir Doctors and Fekra College Student Union. And she has special interest in uh, uh, future neurosurgery and uh, her topic will be the evolution of neurosurgical sciences and its futuristic potentials. So I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Heba Azuz, to present her presentation, please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ishu. Uh, I hope uh, my presentation won't take a lot of time uh, because we're already running out of time and it's, a, it's considered to be a light uh, topic uh, just to refresh our minds, uh, something outside the tumors and the blood and everything we know about the neurosurgery. So um, I hope that presentation is uh, available on your screens now. Yes. Great. So uh, I would like to give a, a quick intro about uh, 
the history of uh, neurosurgery and in Egypt as well. So I would uh, first introduce Hatshepsut. She is uh, considered to be the second uh, pharaoh to actually rule the kingdom of Egypt. Uh, she was the second one after Saba Knefru. Uh, the cool thing or the outstanding thing about Hatshepsut, not just that she is the ruler of Egypt, uh, her actually uh, temple weren't built uh, on stones. It was craved in the mountains. So it has a peculiar uh, atmosphere and a peculiar architecture as well. Uh, also, the goddess of um, healing and of medicine in the Egyptian culture is called Sikhmet. She will be drawn in a lot of temples, giving the remedies to different things. But the medicine in the ancient pharaohs period weren't actually just about remedies and plants. They also had refination and they had also neurosurgical cases that were documented. Uh, those are two pictures uh, describing the termination. Maybe they didn't have the uh, terminology of neurosurgery. There were more of a psychosurgery uh, procedure at that time described. Uh, those were actually the craved uh, surgical tools they need for the neurosurgical approaches in the ancient uh, uh, Egyptian period. Uh, this was actually used also for the posterior approaches for the termination. Also, they had a transnasal uh, transphenoidal approaches with the uh, long curette and everything, but they had like almost zero morbidity for one reason. It's because they did it on the dead in the mummification process. So no morbidity to be considered. And they used to take all the brain out of the nostril. Also on the Ottoman Empire, they were used uh, this art to describe an epilepsy surgery. Uh, also, there was a lot of uh, description about spine and other uh, general surgery procedure uh, that we can learn from other cultures through art. In the Japanese period, in the Edo period, uh, this is an uh, art illustrating art uh, surgery for the eye operation. Um, and also, we had an understanding of the anatomy in the Edo period in the Japan uh, by trying to understand the, the brain and uh, the anatomical dissection of it. Also, there was an illustration uh, presented that didn't have the name of hydrocephalus, but now, as we can see, it's a hydrocephalic patient. Uh, so through art, we have managed to know a lot of uh, surgical procedure, even in the medieval area, uh, with the terminations and a lot of arts describing this. Uh, also, some people actually contribute that Michael Anglo picture of creation of Adam is just a metaphor of uh, the brain. Uh, that God represents, and that's how we create our reality. Through, through art, we actually got to understand a lot of the history and a lot of the progression and the evolution of uh, anatomy and of disease, and also the operation room. This was, uh, almost, uh, I'm almost sure that a lot of people saw those drawings or similar drawings of how the operating room was compared to the new one we have right now. If you want to talk about art, we have to men mention uh, Kahal, and he is the doctrine of uh, um, the neuron and the father of the understanding of the physiology of the neuron and hence the neuroscience uh, perspective of the pathway and uh, other things that were established about, upon it. Uh, other 50 years later, there's a psychologist, Frank Rosenbaut, who uh, created the artificial neuron which is precisely the same as a biological neuron that it implies, it implies the same concept of receiving input and then transferring this input into an output. So uh, the artificial neuron was the cornerstone and the first step of building the IBM, which is the first computer made. And then they tried to make uh, use of the artificial neuron in the manufacturing of sound. So they created the first song, which is a computer and sound generatic song, which is called Daisy Ben. You could check it on the YouTube. And that was the first sound to be generated from a computer. Uh, if you look also through the history of implants and uh, DBS, we would find that uh, in the 1947, they started to uh, um, build the stereotactical uh, lexal frame. And then in the 60s, they tried to make an uh, implant uh, on the cows and the animals, uh, like a DBS for controlling of behavior. Didn't had a lot of success later on, but it helped in the step of the base maker uh, to be done uh, in 1958. Uh, in the 80s, they started the, the DBS. Uh, and as you know, it has a lot of success 
in the movement disorder and some of the functional and uh, even psychological disorders nowadays. Um, even if you look about the imaging, we would see how the evolution of the skin. Uh, I know the screen looks so condensed, but uh, we first had an introduction about the X-ray and the CT scan in the 73. And then we knew about the oxygen uh, measurements in the MRI, which is 82. And later on in the 90s, we made use of both the MRI and the oxygen level to have uh, the impression of the functional MRI that gave us a lot of understanding about the longitudinal tracts and about the, the functional areas and how to plan your surgery preoperatively. So if you want to see the evolution also of artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence was first coded in 56. Uh, 10 years later, they made the first robot, which is shaky. Uh, later on, that's the first robot they have. Uh, later on, they made the Deep Blue Sea, which is actually uh, the chess player, and it won uh, over the greater champion of chess. Um, then they made the first robot, uh, which is, uh, can be achieved at home and it's accessible, which is basically a vacuum cleaner. Even though some cats have a different opinion about it, it's still a vacuum cleaner. And uh, later on, we have all kind of artificial intelligence in our pockets, like Siri in your phone or uh, facial recognition and things like that. So if we want to talk about the evolution of artificial intelligence in, um, in neurosurgery, we will divide them into two main categories. Uh, first of all is the recording, as we see in the electrode uh, grid of the cortex that helps in uh, monitoring the electricity or my, my, the EEG. And um, this is the recording part. And also we have the transmitting part, which is the deep brain stimulation. Also, maybe a lot of you can be familiar with the auditory um, response, uh, the, the chip that you actually put it in, uh, you implant it, it uh, collects the information and collect the, the waves of the audio waves, uh, it transmits it into an electrode based on the, the brainstem. So it, it somehow merges between the two previous concepts. Also recently in the artificial intelligence uh, or um, uh, helping in the surgeries are two main things. And I'll try to make it um, very um, simplified to understand the difference between them. It's the virtual reality. When you somehow you just wear glasses and then you try to operate or you try to figure or try to see things uh, through a virtual uh, meaning like the glasses or the goggles that you wear. It helps in a lot of surgical planning. It helps in teaching. It also might help in surgical or patient education that uh, the patient could have. The difference between visual reality and visual augmented reality uh, is that uh, the augmented reality, you could have those image uh, from the Googles or from, your, uh, from the uh, glasses or the instrument you're using to help you interpret some of the patient's information uh, along with the anatomical uh, real image that you're having. Like uh, they had this operation in John Hopkins, uh, the first augmented reality, which is used in spine uh, fixation. So they could use both of uh, the virtual images they have on the actual real image of the patient. So uh, the future actually shouldn't be uh, repetitive of what we had in the previous. So actually, it doesn't have to make any sense. But we're not so far away from actually having a different uh, era in the the in the merging of the neurosurgical science and the artificial intelligence. And, but before we have to go through this, I would be quoting Richard Feynman. He's, uh, he's my favorite scientist and he had the Nobel Prize in math. So uh, some questions that we might actually consider to be um, very uh, clear or that we already know the answers, it's how we understand science. A lot of people consider science as facts and that's it. But uh, the other, important thing about science, it has to be questionable. And the good thing about it is actually evol evoluting through the, the errors that uh, the time that we had. And a lot of people, and a, lo and a lot of stories we had about uh, facts that were considered uh, facts as science, and then it came out to be totally the different, like uh, Apollo and the Vatican, considering the, the revolving of the earth around the sun or vice versa. The other thing that we actually consider very granted in science is the why versus how. So you might say like, why is the ocean blue? 
and then you will find like your question is very reasonable. But if you look through the answer, the answer, the answer is just the how can we see the ocean blue? It's the, the only light wave that's not absorbed by the ocean is the blue and hence we see blue. And it's not the reflection of the sky or anything, but it's not a why, it's how it is blue. The other thing is that now might a lot of people be wondering if machine can replace the surgeon or machine can replace the human. Um, I think this is not really true. And I'll also be calling, calling uh, Richard Feynman on this. So I'll give you an example to, to let you know how machine are not supposed to be like human or to replace the surgeon. And the, the idea before going into this explanation is that we have to understand that we are making a machine or we actually using the artificial intelligence to amplify and to use, to do things that better than us and more efficient than we can. Like, I will give you an example. If you saw, if you saw the birds flying, which is the first stereotype in flying, I guess, that human knew, uh, after it, he tried a lot of trials to make an airplane. And they have the same purpose, which is flying. But if you look closely to the mechanism, birds actually fly by flapping their wings. But airplanes work with a turbo, turbo engine, which is um, basically heating up the air so it can elevate the plane. So it has a totally different mechanism and it's not replacing the birds. They have totally different thing, but we got the idea from birds. So machines shouldn't be replacing this. This should be amplifying some facts or some steps that we needed in the OR or in the diagnosis on actually in improving the quality of life of our patients. So the information and the answers are actually quite there everywhere. Uh, we just need to connect between the dots to find an answer. And then the question should be, what are we willing to do? Uh, are we trying to perform uh, perfect radiological uh, post-operative images or are we trying to improve the quality of our, our patient? So in my opinion, the only way we can achieve a proper uh, or a good quality life to our patient is if we can come along in the same platform uh, between surgeon and technician, mathematician and different genre of science and different cultural backgrounds. And then we could actually come up with a solution where all the obstacles that we could consider handicapping our um, fellow friends and patients that they are uh, disabled from uh, paralysis or visual impairment and other things that we have already came across in our field. And the only discrimination we can use is in the restroom. Um, that's it. And I hope you give yourself uh, the opportunity to open up your brains and your mind to accept different answers and accept different cultures and to accept the, the question that's, that still doesn't have an answer at the moment. Uh, by just collaborating together, and we might find even a better answer than the one we're looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it was a very wonderful lecture, and it was different from, from our usual neurosurgical lecture. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a nice perspective, and we should look for uh, such kind of lectures and perspectives so uh, I think there will be more of comments and commentaries from our audiences. I would like to invite all the audiences to ask questions or give some comments, please. Yeah, I, I liked very much your presentation, uh, Heba. Thank you. Uh, it's a nice journey throughout the, the evolution uh, in surgery in general and specifically in neurosurgery uh, with uh, glimpse towards the future. Um, my question is, uh, which field of neurosurgery do you think uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, will make the difference in the future? I mean, do you think robotics will make the difference, uh, interoperative robotics? Do you think uh, uh, instrumentations for better visualization will make the difference? I'm asking because, or maybe, something about diagnosis i'm i'm asking because i have the feeling that surgery itself uh, uh, got uh, to a very very high level so far uh, micro neurosurgery at least uh, so i am sometimes sometimes i'm uh, wondering 
what can we do to improve our uh, our profession uh, in a in a uh, better way uh, is it through diagnosis or visualization or or what what's your your feeling right. uh, okay so definitely i don't have a uh, actual answer to this but this is just my opinion to it uh, and as you mentioned uh, two steps of uh, the patient's life is the diagnosis and the operation. And we a lot of the time forget about the post-operative uh, phase of the patient. I mean, sometimes people are actually paralyzed for a spinal fracture and then you do the surgery and it's awesome surgery, but the rest of that patient's life uh, still needs a lot of improvement. Uh, it still needs a lot of focus. So sometimes we, after quitting the OR, we forget. Uh, that this patient is still going on with this disability. So my, my hope is uh, our concern could shift to see a patient, to consider him as a human being with all the disabilities that he has and how we can, we can actually help him through this. So uh, yeah, I, I think it, it will help a lot in the diagnosis as the function and MRI, tractography, it's, it's already helping. And the more we uh, work on the VR and the understanding of uh, preoperative uh, visualization of a tumor and the blood vessels invading it or the structures around it, it could help you a lot in the planning and help you in the dissection of a tumor, for instance. And it could help you on the OR. It helps you in the teach, uh, teaching the patients as well. Uh, but I, I would love if we have our perspective uh, from the patient after the OR extended a little bit, how to improve his quality of life instead of doing a good OR, a good operation. Again. So. Maybe that's my perspective. Thank you. Thank you. The point was uh, the, uh, nicely mentioned because uh, such kind of experiences, I think every uh, neurosurgeon have faced. Sometimes we do good surgery and uh, the post-op scan is good, but still the patient is not that good. It happened with me. I operated one case of uh, frontal lobe glioma near speech area and uh, the post-op scan was good showing complete resection, but the patient developed aphasia and uh, she is gradually recovering, but I was not happy. And there was one patient, uh, the, she had brainstem lipoma. I operated that patient and I was able to remove small chunk of tumor, but she is still surviving and uh, the, the, she was a baby girl and she is still very happy and her power improved. But post-op scan was, like it was a very much a very minimum removal only the bony decompression that helped and somehow the outcome was very good i am always surprised that sometimes the scans they are not very good and we need to change our pers perspective like uh, we we should uh, look for the patient outcome rather than for the scans we are very much based on scans especially neurosurgeons yeah yeah thank you I agree. I agree with you, Isho, actually. Yeah. And do you, uh, Heba, or also other people who are listening, do you have uh, some kind of collaboration with uh, other uh, professionists? As Heba correctly said, we, we need to interact with other uh, people uh, in our job. It can be biologists or uh, engineers or uh, whatever just to make our uh, perspective be wider, right? Mm -hmm. So my question is to, to everyone is, uh, do you have collaborations in this, in this way with someone else or just the focus on, uh, on neurosurgery itself? Uh, for, for me, uh, we have a small initiative between uh, us and uh, people in uh, computer science and we're trying to develop and uh, like, uh, it's not a video game, but it's, it's, that's the simplified form of it, uh, of how to operate an endonasal surgery. So instead of uh, getting uh, your training on a cadavers or on um, actual patients, maybe you could have a little insight uh, on a virtual reality. Um, this project is still in the initiation phase, uh, and I hope uh, it's not me only. I hope all of us could actually open our mind just for the idea of the collaboration uh, for more progress. So yeah. I'd love to know if anyone else is, uh, is having any thoughts. Yeah, about the post-operative uh, um, phase, uh, we are now developing 
system with telemedicine just to follow up patients uh, after surgery when they are at home uh, using their smartphones, uh, especially those uh, operated on for spinal surgery. Uh, just to see how they move, uh, you know, they, their improvements uh, or if they don't have improvement. Uh, so I think uh, this is another way to deal with uh, the, the post-operative phase uh, of our patients. So that would be good for the patients? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think with uh, connecting with other departments of even with uh, like other departments, ENT, opth ophthalmology or physiotherapist, uh, that will also help. Uh, rather, and uh, if connecting with engineers, biotechnologists, uh, that will take to another level. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So, so mm -hmm. please. Yeah, I was asking any more comments, please. So if, uh, if not, if not, uh, we uh, should ask maybe uh, Sachin. I see you are connected with us. Uh, maybe you you can uh, uh, you can uh, let us know something more about uh, Congress uh, World Young Neurosurgery uh, Congress. So please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Albert. Am I audible clearly? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. So, first of all, uh, congratulations to both the speakers, uh, Dr. Robertson and Dr. Heba. I know Dr. Heba, she's a member of our ACNSYNS committee also, and wonderful lectures. But uh, I have a little different perspective uh, about the future of neurosurgery. Uh, more than the technology, I feel that the understanding of the brain itself is, I feel it is uh, under understood or mal understood. Uh, what we know is only five areas is speech area, the motor homunculus, sensory homunculus, limbic system, and the uh, vision area. So there are a lot of areas in the brain, like mood, like behavior, affect, the intelligence. So these are some areas which are still less understood as. Dr. Vishnu said, although he operated on the right side, the patient had a, a difficulty in speech. I remember I had a patient who was deaf and dumb from the birth, and uh, we got the uh, functional MRI done for this child. And fortunately, we got the speech area, the speech area uh, which is supposed to show the tongue movement. Okay, that's how we speak. Instead of some moment, this patient had a very, very big, large hand area because all his communication was through his hands. Yes. The brain has taken over the hand area. So that's how so I feel the brain is very less understood. If we try to understand brain more and more, I think the functional neurosurgery has a lot of potential. A lot of people with depression and bipolar disorder, the way the world is progressing, deep brain stimulation surgery has a lot of potential which is still uh, less utilized or less explored. But uh, congratulations to Dr. Heba, wonderful uh, presentation. So uh, I am here to make one announcement, uh, probably the first announcement. So we are planning to have as a part of activity of ACNS to YNS. Is my screen visible to everyone? Yes, yes it is. Okay. So. Let me make it a full screen if I am able to make it. Yeah. Is it still visible? Yes, it is. Yeah. So as a part of ACNS, YNS uh, uh, activity, we are planning this dedicated first world uh, neurosurgeons congress. Now, as we can see the way everything uh, uh, is going, COVID is still showing some vaccine and vanning, like a post-operative neuro patient. Uh, the new new variants are coming. The uh, the, the, the intercontinental and inter country transport is still not uh, fully open, and there are restrictions for conducting in person conference. And uh, so we thought of having this uh, first dedicated World Young Neurosurgeon Congress because in the conferences it used to be sort of like a festival for all the young neurosurgeons 
uh, you meet all your uh, mentors, the, the, the icon or the leaders of uh, different different specialties, interact with them, listen to their lectures, make new friends, a lot of hands-on workshops, but that all is missing. So we thought of putting up one uh, dedicated uh, conference or a congress. Uh, maybe we can do it in a hybrid way, but we are still into the planning of that. Uh, uh, first World Young Neurosurgeon Congress, uh, we'll, we are planning to have it on six, seven, eight, three days dedicated for the young neurosurgeon and the theme of this thing, Horizon for the Young Neurosurgeons. And as it is organized by ACNS, a Young Neurosurgeon Committee, along with the WFNS, we're trying to collaborate all the different, different Young Neurosurgeon Committees of Africa, Latin America, uh, the WFNS, and bring all together and have a wonderful uh, one-day Congress. The main highlight of this thing will be, although it is the Young Neurosurgeon Congress, but definitely we are not missing out the medical students. There will be one dedicated session for uh, women in neurosurgery. And uh, there will be, uh, we're planning to have four workshops. One will be on the intervention radiology, one will be on the bypass surgery, one will be exclusively on the cadaver uh, dissection, and one more will be about the innovations in neurosurgery. Now, uh, there will be four uh, special sessions which uh, will be basically on the challenges of neurosurgery and low and middle income countries. Uh, uh, there'll be one session about the collaboration of all the intercontinental uh, uh, young neurosurgeon committees and their views, and we'll have a, a good interaction of what are the different challenges and difficulty in different continent to continent. Another session will be in the research in neurosurgery, and the highlight of this Congress will be a session about mentorship in neurosurgery. So we are we trying to get the the speakers, the legendary speakers of neurosurgery, uh, who will who are going to share with us uh, their experience of their journey of almost 40, 50, 60 years of neurosurgery, and it'll be wonderful to listen to their experiences and uh, uh, interact with them. And along with that, we're going to have a special session which. Uh, will be uh, uh, managed or uh, coordinated or moderated by the uh, uh, the faculties who are the expert faculties of like that uh, of that particular uh, uh, aspect of neurosurgery like spell based professor vladimir benes uh, for cv junction professor rasul goel spine ms professor professor mehmed cbd dr sano so like that, we're going to have uh, certain sessions wherein uh, they're going to have uh, uh, their own uh, lectures, their own uh, cases. Along with that, there'll be uh, two or three another uh, uh, speakers who will, which will be uh, decided by those particular speakers and one hour of uh, uh, interactive session. At the end, we're going to have one YNS Congress, YNS competition, wherein... Uh, we are uh, inviting all the young neurosurgeons and medical students to put up uh, their uh, see, uh, put up their uh, uh, papers, and uh, uh, we're going to have special award. Professor Yoko Kato has decided to give uh, one thousand US dollars, and uh, all these uh, three uh, winners of the young neurosurgeon. Uh, Competition will be a uh, member of the ACNS Finance Committee and they'll be given opportunity to have uh, the same paper which they have published, uh, which the same paper they have presented to be published in the ACNS AJNS journal, which is the uh, journal of uh, ACNS Society. So that is the whole Congress it's about. It will be on 6th, 7th, and 8th May. So I uh, request all of you to kindly. Uh, uh, share the news about this particular Congress with all your friends and we are inviting as much as uh, uh, papers for the virus Congress and please kindly attend it and please give your views if anything specifically you want to hear which you are not able to uh, hear in any other webinars so please uh, share your views about if you want any other particular activity to be done. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Sachin, uh, for this announcement. So uh, we will save the date for this event. Um, OK, I think we are at uh, the closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, to our speakers, uh, Professor Scott Robertson and Dr. Heba uh, Azuz for uh, wonderful uh, talks. Uh, thank you to uh, Professor Ishu Bishnoi, my co-moderator. And thank you uh, to all uh, the audience uh, and all the friends who joined today. So thank you so much and see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Everybody be safe. Thank you. Bye.